Hello guys and welcome back to Let's Compose. Uh, today we're going to talk about a bit of material. Um, uh, this is the the first bit of writing. I guess it's not really writing. Uh, it's going to be a while till I actually write any notes. I do a lot of uh, a lot of pondering before that happens. So uh, I've got three pieces of material in mind today. There's quite a lot of different things that we can get out of what this piece is about. Just to remind you, this piece is about my uh, trip to Italy. It's a 1,400 kilometres of cycle ride and um, it was down the west coast of Italy. It's a very beautiful place uh, and it's going to be about that. But right now I'm thinking about material relating to the bike and how the bike works. There's quite a huge number of things we can do here there's quite a huge number of things we can do with all sorts of material. I mean, if you think about it, every day there was a different number of kilometres. Every day there was uh, uh, a different sort of shape to it, a different idea. There were lots of different folky things I went through. I went through uh, different scenery. I could talk about the shape of the scenery and I could talk about the type of people I met, I could talk about some folk traditions I came across, although honestly didn't come across much folk music while I was there. Um, or I could talk about the mechanisms of the bike, I could talk about how I dealt with the bike, how I used it, or anything like that. And there's Really, whenever you come to write a piece about something, there's always going to be a certain amount of paring down to important things and things that will make musical sense and things that you can use for music. Uh, I don't quite agree with just transcribing uh, experience onto music. It's, a, it's about creating musical objects and musical ideas which you can use. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about, and it's something that I've used before, so that's what we're going to talk about straight away, um, is breathing. Uh, whenever I um, do any sort of sport, the first thing I think about is breathing. Uh, uh, I mean, especially the bike and especially swimming, actually. Swimming and breathing is incredibly important, but on the bike, uh, <coughs> rhythm is very important. Uh, how you, your cadence as you're cycling is very important. How the gears work and how uh, you work with the gears, your heart rate, etc all very important. Uh, breathing is the first thing I think of though and in pieces before I've used this kind of texture that we're going to use and I've got already got some nice ideas for it. Um, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to map out a rhythm actually over in the treble cliff there. Let's get rid of that. Let's put a percussive cliff so we can just see exactly what's going to happen. So just going to make this up a little bit here and then you've got a good idea of what I'm doing. Um, so it's a very simple gesture. It's basically an overlap. Um, so we have that going on there. and that going on there. So what we have here is a gesture where this is an in-breath, so I'm breathing in here and I'm starting to breathe out there, breathing in and then out again. Now I overlap them, I know it's not quite how your breathing works, obviously you sure you breathe in and you breathe out. You have a little pause between when you breathe in and when you breathe out. Um, but I like to think of this as preparing the next breath when you get to here. And it, it just kind of works better instrumentally. Uh, although I have done, in the past, I've done things with that little gap between uh, the breaths. I had a singer breathe in and pause and breathe out again to create a particular idea. Uh, but in this case, we've got a very regular beat going on, something really regular and really together and flowing, and that's why we were overlapping them. But they'll be very different sounds, so it'll be very noticeable that they're breathing in, out, in and out. Uh, as to the sounds we're going to use for this, so this is where 
I often use uh, white noise on instruments, particularly on string instruments, it's very easy to do. Uh, if you think about how a string instrument is made up, you have your neck here, and you have your pegs there, the string is coming down. This isn't the greatest of little sketches, I'm afraid. There we go. They come across a bridge here. This is the gap where the uh, where the string where the uh, bow goes across to play the strings. Here's the bridge, which is made out of wood. The strings come down here into a little tailpiece, which is usually made out of a uh, like a carbon composite. Usually, it's not often wood unless you're on an older instrument. And uh, if we then draw the body around it, comes around like that, goes in, comes back. Now this is not a great drawing at all, I'm sorry. It's very exaggerated, it's never as fat as this, for example. But this is the basic kind of layout of, of string instruments. You've got the uh, a little arch there, you've got an F hole here. Usually it looks a bit more like an F. There we go. And we have the base here. And it comes back up again. And so this is usually thinner up here and down here. And on cellos you have a little spike. And oh, you can't see that on them. And you have a little spike coming out the bottom, which is usable too. Uh, so this is the tailpiece. Uh, this is the bridge. Pont, if you like. Pont in France, in French. Uh, I, I live in France, I often use those. Um, and this is an F hole. This is the neck. And it's obviously bowed. The particular, we'll talk about the bow a bit. Well, mention it anyway. Um, so, when you bow up here, it produces, across the wood that is, it produces quite a high noise sound. Uh, with high partials, when I talk about noise, I'm talking about a where you can't really take out the pitch, you can't make out any pitches, but there are harmonics in there, uh, nevertheless. And when you bow a smaller piece of wood, then you get higher ha higher partials, it sounds higher when you bow a medium sized. Around here, it's, it's more resonant because of the F hole. Um, and because of its position within the whole instrument, so you get a slightly lower um, set of partials, and on the bass, you get lower still. Now, most of these positions are reachable on the instruments, but you've got to bear in mind how quickly the the string player has to move between them. Um, oh, the other thing is, if you bow the bridge here, you get really quite a loud sound, and it can often have a tiny high pitched partial in it, pit, a bit of pitch. Um, it quite, can be quite hard to get just the sound, but it's also quite a grating sound. It's not always that pleasant, but it is a it is an interesting sound to use. The tailpiece here, if you bow that um, on violins and violas, it doesn't really sound. Uh, it's not very nice. It's not very useful. Whereas on the cello, it often sounds uh, a low pitch, but it's a very spooky low pitch. It makes me feel a bit bleh when you listen to it. Uh, I love it. I love that sound. It's usually around a BB flat as well. So it's it's kind of a useful thing to use. It's very, very quiet and very spooky. But in this case, um, so you can imagine um, playing the higher partial for breathing in and the lower partial for breathing out. So you play up here to breathe in, down there to breathe out. For example, if you start on uh, noise, which is what I'm going to be doing. Uh, and I'd notate it like this. I've made up my own notations for these things. So this is 
just a little drawing I do of the side of the instrument. You can see it corresponds to this. Whenever I draw the things, I include a little diagram which shows exactly this, where this is low and this is a high string to show exactly where you are on the instrument. This would be a breathing in, a diamond head note shape showing exactly where to bow on the instrument, for example, and this might be breathing out. Again, diamond head uh, showing how to go the direction in which to bow, to, um, bow the instrument. Um, and you can do the same on the other side if you want to be that prescriptive. Uh, and it sometimes helps if you say how you imagine that the string player is going to do it. So that's why I often use both sides. Another way you can do also, by the way, I forgot to say, is that you can mute the string. If you put your finger very close to where the bow, bow is playing, then you can just about get it to play silently across the string. It's harder to do, but it, it produces a different sound. Um, and all of these things are just different sounds that you can use. They're all good. So that's the start of what I'm going to do. That I mean, this uh, this idea of going in and out. There's a bit more to it as well, by the way. Uh, if you think about when you breathe in, there's a bit of a, a, a crescendo towards the top of the in. And a decrescendo towards the bottom of the out. Um, so there's two different aspects of it there. Uh, and the way this is going to progress um, is uh, that particular that set of ideas, if you like, what I call a model, um, can be used in different ways as well. You don't just have to use it for a sound that you are playing. You can use it for um, what what I call a filter effect. If you imagine, if you're playing a guitar sound, if you're playing a guitar and then you add a wah wah mute to it, it filters the sound so it changes it um, based on what your foot's doing and your foot's very powerful it can change the entire sound while your fingers are making all sorts of different sounds and that's what I mean by a filter effect so I may have lots of different things going on at once but everyone could have this crescendo uh, everyone could be starting out there and then overlapping this decrescendo material um, and so you've got this filter effect that go that can go right the way through the piece and that's what this is this material is going to do. It's going to go right the way through the piece. It's not always going to be forefront. You're not always going to hear it exactly as I'm writing it, but it's going to be a, a big theme in the piece. Um, the other thing I'm going to do, when it's, this actually becomes melodic, so it's going to start out as a filter, and then it's going to go to a noise sound, and then it's going to become melodic. In fact, it's going to I've already picked out the notes that it's going to use, and for this I'm going to need a little bit more manuscript, so I'm just going to move this camera here. So uh, the other thing you can do um, on stringed instruments is to play harmonics. So I talked about the harmonic series last time. Um, so on a cello, if you're playing on the G string, a natural harmonic series, you can start Playing this one, which is an octave above, then a fifth. So if I get it right this time, I didn't even write it right. Uh, and then up to a fourth, and then so on, so on. And you do that by stopping the string very lightly with your finger at various points. Um, and it happens that on a stringed instrument, you can get, um, let's, let's put this in the treble clef. So imagine I'm playing on the G string, which is this note here. So an octave above that is this G here, and there's a D and there's a G. You can get that note there on the G string. You can get this note here on the D string. Uh, fundamental, because it's the fifth it's an octave and a fifth above the D. And you can get this note here again on the G string. 
Um, we write this, by the way, as either sol G or um, or three in Roman numerals. This one is two or sol D. Again, sol G. Now, if you run out of videotape, uh, which is what I was going to say, obviously, uh, as I did, uh, but instead I talked to myself for the next five minutes, not realising that we had run out of videotape again. Okay, I'm going to have to work out how to use this video camera properly, but oh well, <laughs> I'll go back to where I was. Uh, so we are just talking about how you can get these harmonics on the uh, G string and the D string, which are next door to each other so it's easy to overlap them like we want to on our breathing idea. <coughs> and um, that's, on the, that's on the cello, of course. Now, harmonics are written like this, if you don't know. You write the fundamental, or you write the harmonic that you're after, and you write a little circle above it. That's if it's a natural harmonic. Uh, we'll get to artificial harmonics at some point. Um, <coughs> but uh, you tend to write those an octave below the pitch that you require, but I tend to write them at pitch. I think I just prefer to be less ambiguous. Uh, I always, always mention that in the score, make it very clear that it's at pitch because uh, performers will expect it to be an octave below. Uh, but I, I find for myself that that uh, gets rid of any ambiguities. <coughs> so uh, what you can do also is if you use the instrument above this, um, a viola, for example, and use a C string on that. The, the fourth partial on that is a C, which is just above that B, and you get this really lovely cluster. And that's what we're going to aim towards for this bit of material. Uh, so as you can see, you can use this material again. High note is the uh, breathing in, and low note is breathing out and you can build up a beautiful little cluster of notes up at the top of the range because <clears throat> they're all high harmonics as well. So that that's pretty much what I have for the breathing idea at the moment. There's quite a lot we can do with that and you'll see as we go on it becomes a very important part of the piece. Or it will do when I've written the piece. And, uh, and that's it. In fact uh, I t said I was going to talk about the three different types of material today, but this has gone on for quite a while now. So I am going to cut here. I'll record the rest of it today, and I'll put them out in the next couple of episodes. So it'll be a three-parter, maybe two or three-parter. Um, that's the first bit of material. I hope you enjoyed that. Please uh, leave a like if you liked it, and if you'd like to hear more, uh, you can subscribe to me. Just click the subscribe button below the video. Uh, and you'll get my videos in your stream. But if you leave a like, anyway, if you like it, um, leave a like. It really helps me out because people can see <coughs> that you liked it, your your YouTube followers, etc., and your friends. I tell your friends, send the word out. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Okay, bye.